Good afternoon. Welcome to our show. I'm your host, Melissa Ridge, and this is a show for all of you who love to eat. I've always loved tasty food, but this pandemic seems to have me appreciating food a little differently. Our country foods, our comfort foods, what goes into each of every one of these dishes, how it's grown, the hands that make it, the love put into it all. I have a much greater appreciation for all of it. Today, we are putting indigenous foods in focus. We have two cooks from the Feast Cafe uh, and Bistro right here in Winnipeg who have created recipes, especially for our in focus audience. Have your fish ready for one of those recipes and your bison or deer or moose or caribou ready for the other recipe. Mouth watering. And we are so honored that these two men developed these dishes for us to share with all of you. Ahead of that, we will talk to the National Museum of the American Indian about foods that have been proven to exist here pre-contact. I can guarantee you some on the list might surprise you. And we have some incredible food photos from all of you, your favorite country food dishes. Uh, we also talked to the Sioux, uh, a Sioux caterer with some tips about uh, what, how to cook your wild meats. A jam-packed show, f uh, of course, you can call in, but um, actually, no, we would prefer not to call in. Just leave your comment on our Facebook Live feed and please put a, a picture of your favorite dish uh, in there too. You can share any of your favorite food uh, secrets as well. Um, so we are going to get right to it. Before I introduce you to our first guest, I want you to take the, uh, I want to take you to the Mitsudam Cafe. It's at the Smithsonian. Mitsudam means let's eat in the language of the Delaware. It's one of the best eateries in the world featuring regional indigenous foods from all corners of the United States. Take a look. First course is coming out. Salute. What we try to do in, within the Mitsudam is really do um, indigenous foods of the areas that we represent and then put them together in a way that works for the everyday customer and, and you know, for the foodies of the of the new world, I should say. So we have the, the quinault fried salmon, so you have the salmon, you have the preserved lemon, you have the bison hanger steak with the huckleberry sauce, and then you have the artichoke puree there kind of, kind of pushed off to the side. There really is a resurgence in kind of Native American cuisine, if you could call it that that people are actually starting to really enjoy. This is a wood-fired oyster with a sorrel butter. You know, the oysters obviously being um, indigenous to the area, the sorrel, the sorrel itself being indigenous to it. You know, would they have torched it or anything like that? No, but they were baking oysters, clams, and different things like that. Now it's just a kind of a culinary representation. The oyster on top is gonna to be a little bit cooked and then underneath it's gonna be almost like a raw oyster. But we want you to taste what the flavors are and what we're trying to get out of the food. There's an opportunity to to really complete the mission and give give more to the to the everyday guests that are coming in and then actually grow something. We do it because we enjoy it, but it really makes it fun to be able to put foods together like this that, that you wouldn't typically see in a museum restaurant. Some of the most incredible food I've ever had was at Mitsudam. Joining us now, Kevin Gover. He is the director of the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian. That's where that Mitsudam Cafe is located. He's Pawnee and has some amazing historical knowledge about the foods of Turtle Island. He joins us from Washington, D.C. Kevin, so I loved reading in Indian Country today. Uh, you had identified a whole bunch of foods that uh, I think maybe people either assumed had been brought over from Europe or maybe perhaps that settlers had taken credit for bringing over, uh, but were in fact here for millennia. Of course, we know, uh, you know, the standard ones, wild rice, gourds, uh, you know, maize, uh, an assortment of berries. But what are some of the lesser known foods that have been here in North and South America long before uh, settlers arrived to take credit? for bringing them well of course in, in addition to the to the uh, the foods that that uh, have always been here uh, uh, salmon and bison and deer and, and that sort of thing um, but people tend not to know that if it weren't for native agriculturalists uh, of the past that we wouldn't have things like uh, spaghetti sauce and uh, and we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't get to enjoy our mashed potatoes on Thanksgiving Day yes um, yes and then there were other, you know, um, uh, indigenous crops from the Americas uh, provide now about 60% of the, of the cash crops worldwide. 
And so in a very real sense, a native agrarian. That too, you know, tomatoes, as you would say, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have spaghetti sauce if it wasn't for tomatoes. Potatoes, I think we, a lot of us think, oh, that's, you know, must be a European thing. We think of Irish people. That's in fact not the case. There is evidence that these have been here for millennia, correct? Yes, no, they were very deliberately grown. If you ever go uh, to, uh, to South America, to Peru, to one of their open markets, you'll see dozens of varieties of potatoes and they're still grown in, in uh, much the same way that they always were. You'll see people working in the fields um, and uh, as, they, as they plant their potato fields and their, their corn fields. And of course they have, they had a magnificent agricultural civilization mm. uh, in the Andes where they could grow crops on mountainsides and were very specific, very scientific uh, in their work, they had uh, elaborate irrigation systems and drainage systems so to, to, uh, to farm on the sides of mountains. But they also were aware that uh, at each different level of, uh, of the terraces that they were building, that different crops would thrive in, in those particular zones. So they were, they were magnificent uh, uh, growers of crops. Mm. Uh, I found it very interesting when I had visited uh, the museum uh, that the Mitzitam Cafe, uh, it was just mind-blowingly good. It's truly a gem of Washington's uh, food scene. It's not, I don't think people don't equate like, oh, a museum with, you know, culinary greatness. Why was, uh, why was the cafe such an important part of, uh, of the museum in the thought and development process of it? Well, the, the restaurant at the museum was always thought of as another exhibit mm. and an opportunity to, uh, to keep teaching people, even as they were eating, that, uh, that the foods to which they're accustomed um, were, uh, were developed by, by Native Americans. And so we do serve all of those foods, uh, including the wild ones, like, like wild rice. But even that, you know, it, even though it, it seems to have evolved on its own, um, was cultivated. Mm -hmm. and, and cared for very specifically by, by the people uh, in that part of the country. So, um, so we, we just like to continually deliver the message that, uh, that you're, you're, you're on native land and native people had uh, well-established civilizations long before contact. I love too that it's not just this monolithic kind of approach to here you're eating native food, right? And there's, there's so many regions that are represented in the cafe. Can you tell us a little bit about the thought that goes into making sure that all of these, you know, the different parts are, uh, are represented there? Sure, because uh, the food traditions varied in each part of the country depending on climate and the availability of different resources. So we have, uh, we have a Northwest Coast section where um, where uh, we get our salmon, we uh, we buy our bison uh, directly from tribes um, in in the Great Plains, um, and uh, uh, we feature a Southwest section which features primarily corn and beans, mm -hmm. um, but but put together in some very interesting ways so that the visitor thinks they're uh, they're uh, and they are having a wonderful culinary experience. Um, and at the same time being reminded of the importance of native agriculture to, uh, to their daily diet. Mm. Uh, you know, not everybody is going to be making their way to D.C. anytime soon. We're in the middle of a pandemic, of course. Um, but the museum has a lot going on online. I'm curious, uh, you know, there's a webinar tomorrow about indigenous food security. Uh, can you tell us a little bit how you guys are coping and shifting gears um, and adapting to this kind of pandemic time and, and how it's working out and how people can get involved? You know, I'm really proud of the staff of the museum because, you know, we, we were accustomed to doing things a certain way and the building exhibitions uh, in our galleries and doing programs in our theaters and in our other performance spaces. And, um, and without, uh, without too much um, hesitation or delay, we were able to convert to being primarily an online resource for, uh, for, for our guests. Um, we put a lot of educational materials online. We're doing programs online, like the one on food security tomorrow. Um, we, uh, we opened a National Native American Veterans Memorial last week. We, we knew it would be completed on Veterans Day. Uh, we had planned a grand celebration and bringing you know, as many veterans as possible uh, to the site. That, of course, uh, became impossible. Uh, and so we, we converted it to an online event. Uh, and we'll continue to, uh, to produce more and more content for online consumption. We're now putting new exhibitions online 
Uh, and so, uh, so that's you know that's that's the way it's going to be for a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and in a way, we've learned an important lesson because, in many cases, um, a program that we might have done in in one of our theaters uh, would attract two hundred, you know, a good one, two hundred and fifty people. But when we put them online, we're getting a little foolish that I didn't realize that that uh, that would be the case. Um, but now that we know it, we're, we're going to do our best to uh, to really take advantage of that and, and spread our material uh, further and further. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time out uh, today to sit and chat with us about all the wonderful things that you guys have going on at the museum. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you. You can check out that webinar on Indigenous food security and the many other virt- virtual exhibits offered by the National Museum of the American Indian at AmericanIndian, all one word, dot S-I dot E-D-U. And for a taste of all that served at the Mitzitam uh, Cafe, good news, they have a cookbook which happened to win best cookbook in the world in the local cuisine category at the Gourmand at Paris Cookbook Fair back in 2010. Cookbook is available at most bookstores online, so find it. Uh, it's called the Mitzitam Cafe cookbook. Here's the cover so you know exactly what you're looking for. It's got lots of great new fusion recipes to try uh, and it's a great gift idea for any of the Indigenous foodies who may be on your Christmas list. Back on this side of the border, a new dining experience popped up in Winnipeg that showcased a new twist on our old food. Ishkade was a five-night celebration of our foods. Here's Brittany Hobson with some of the inspiration that you can take into your own kitchen. It doesn't look like fry bread. That's because it's not, but it is what would have been eaten pre-contact. A pop-up restaurant in Winnipeg is creating a new indigenous culinary experience to explore this theme. Trying to restart what was lost, right? So um, what would modern, what would indigenous food today be? Stephen Watson is one of three indigenous chefs creating a seven course meal for the special five night event. It's called Ishkode meaning fire in Ojibwe. The goal? To develop a dinner only using ingredients available pre-colonization, but presenting it in a modern way. This is what I feel it would be if we had 500 years of food development and culture. So that's things like Ishkade is really trying to get back into the culture of it, Um, whereas I can bring the food into that and hopefully uh, with these events like this we can develop a bit of that food culture as well. Glenna Henderson, also known as Cookum Daisy, is known for her bannock or fry bread. But you won't see any of that here because this delicacy was actually brought over by Europeans, a fact many aren't aware of. There is a food that would be considered uh, from Turtle Island. Like there, it's not Canadiana, it's not poutine, it's not you know those things. That there, there were, there was a society here. There was food happening, and that's the things that people need to remember. Food such as berries, bison, fish, and beans those items you will find on this menu. Ishkode is not just about the food alone, it's about the experience and what these dishes mean to Indigenous people. There's nourishment in it, there's life in it, there's you know ways to share those kinds of things and, and, and ensure that you know we uh, represent ourselves in a way that you know provo- proves how beautiful our culture and our people are. Melissa Brown is the third chef involved. Partaking in the event is a new experience in more ways than one. Brown uses her skills to help youth aging out of care. She is Ojibwe and Jamaican and brings both of these cultures into her creations. Okay, so this is my uh, jerk sweet sauce. It's made with Brown started cooking professionally mangoes, only a few um, a years ago. Jerk she says the indigenous food sovereignty movement is putting traditional dishes on the map. That has been happening for like the past two, three years even and chefs are popping up all over just you know highlighting our foods um, before colonialism and that's definitely a movement that I'm trying to be a part of. Brittany Hobson, ABTN National News, Winnipeg. Looks amazing. Uh, well it's time for us to take a break but when we come back uh, get some pickerel, uh, if you got some wild game kicking around, uh, Feast Cafe and Bistro cooks have created incredible recipes, especially for you, our audience, that will use these delicious, tasty things you might have on hand. They are going to walk us through those creations as soon as we come back, and we have some photos of your traditional foods. Stay with us. 
Join our conversation now. Call in toll free at 1 877 647 2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at APTN.ca. Welcome back. A little while ago, before we were back on lockdown and masks were mandatory everywhere, we were welcomed to the Feast Cafe and Bistro here in Winnipeg. Two cooks there created recipes just for In Focus. Let's start with Michael Fosin of Ur Urbanski and his dish, uh, made with bison, but you really could use any wild game that you have on hand. Here, watch and drool. Uh, hi there, I'm Michael. Um, I'm the catering manager from Feast Cafe and uh, today I'm actually going to show you my recipe, my own personal recipe uh, I thought of. Uh, I'm calling it the, the Little Lost Bison. It's an infusion between our indigenous ingredients and an Italian style dish. So I'll, I'll begin. Um, first of all, we're going to start with our, what should I call it, our marinade. So the marinade I made, it's basically just a combination of oil and olive oil and a little bit of uh, garlic puree here a little bit of salt and pepper and a little bit of sweet grass and chopped up sage it's already in there and then uh, you take our nice indigenous style chunks of bison and you just mix it all up and you basically let this just sit there for about a day you know, like overnight kind of thing and you let the flavors just melt in itself and it'll be perfect so after that's done after a day of marinating you'll end up with this 
are marinated by some chunks. So this is like what it looks like when it's been infused with all the flavor of sweetgrass and sage. So once this is all nice and marinated, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the pasta. And while we're making the pasta, we're gonna sear off these bison chunks. Now, I'm a big fan of medium rare steaks. So when you sear it off, I sear it off so that there's still a little bit of blood inside. So these are basically like steak chunks, so it's perfectly fine and okay. Before you start cooking anything, you wanna get your water ready. Make, it nice, make sure it's nice and warm, because uh, you wanna start making your pasta in there. So you wanna get it into a nice rolling boil. A rolling boil means is that when the water starts roiling, uh, boiling, boiling, it'll basically just, you want it at a slow boil. So that way it can just, it won't be overboard, you know? Like when it's too hard of a boil, it'll just keep going really hard. You'll lose most of your water. So you want it to basically be at a nice calm boil, just a nice roll. Anyways, so next you wanna, this is gonna be our pan for searing our bison. So you're gonna wanna spray it down with either oil, like spray, oil spray, or just use regular oil. I personally prefer to use oil spray because you won't get as much of a flame coming out from it. If you use oil, use a very small amount, otherwise the oil from your marinade and this will cause it to shoot flames up. So you gotta be careful. So, I'm gonna give it a nice spray. Now this marinade, I forgot to mention, actually has a little bit of lemon juice in it. Nice little lemon. You can use lemon juice like from a bottle, it's fine. You can. It's really cheap and affordable. It's also, you can, it lasts a long time because you can just put it in the freezer. And it basically lasts forever at that point if you don't have access to a fresh lemon. Fresh lemon is a little bit more optimal. We also add a little bit of uh, maple into this, like a shot of maple, just to add that little bit of flavor. The maple is to allow the beef to have a little bit extra like sugar to the, to the meat itself. While the, while the citrus from the acid of the lemon actually helps break down the meat of the bison so it's nice and tender. Let's start by heating up our pan here. So let's get that guy heated up and while this one's heating up, we're gonna get a little bit of oil in this one, just a shot. It's perfect right there. Don't need much. Let's give it a nice little spread around. Butter is an okay ingredient for this. But butter, as pure as it is, it'll burn if you're not careful. So I find oil's a little better. Don't use olive oil. That'll for sure burn. It has a, the burn rate on, I mean like the, the, the heat level for olive oil to burn is very low. So it won't take much. So just use regular oil like canola or vegetable is fine. So while that pan is heating up for us, this little bit of here, once it's nice and warm, you can tell by putting your hand just a little bit close to it and you can feel the heat coming from it. This one's already almost there, so let's take a little bit of garlic. Little salt and pepper, just for extra seasoning. And you can grab your tongs, you wanna to break that up. So basically what you wanna do is you wanna make it so that your garlic puree just gets a nice little golden toastiness. Now you can tell if it's getting too overcooked because it'll start turning brown. And if it turns brown, then you've cooked it overcooked. It. So you wanna be very careful with that. So I can tell already that I'm starting to do that. So I'm gonna turn this down just slightly just to make sure I don't overcook it. Now you will have your garlic puree sticking to the pan. It's not a big deal. Cause what we are also gonna use is we're gonna take this little shot of uh, just a tiny little half ounce shot of, uh, what should I call it, wine, white wine. And that'll basically give us our deglazing. What white wine does is it deglazes your pan of all the flavor. So stand back. This is going to be a little flamey. As you can tell, all of our flavor came off. Exactly what we want. So now we can add in our milk cream so this is heavy cream you want to make sure it's heavy cream because it needs to be like whipping cream it needs to be able to form itself properly inside the pan when it cooks milk won't really work that well so our other pan here is nice and warm ready to go again be very careful with all this oil if you're not careful you will splash yourself and it will hurt
Now you want to grab another tong for this, as this will have its own flavors and you want to keep it like that. See how it's got that nice little bit of searing on it, nice little bit of brownness? Exactly what you want. That flavor right there. Look at all that flavor. That's about medium rare for me right now, so I don't need that on anymore. That can just sit there now. And let's go back to our pasta sauce. This pasta, while it's boiling like this, you'll get a nice little bubble. Again, you want to make sure it's not too high, because if it gets too high, you will burn the milk. Milk burns at a very easy, it burns very easily, and it will burn on the bottom of this, so you gotta be very careful, especially when you're adding cheese. So, we're gonna add our cheese in now. Add some parm. And this is our gorgonzola. You don't need much. This is very powerful stuff. Seen enough for flavor, that's it. Boom, done. Next we're going to mix all this up, and we're going to let it boil out. As you can see the bubbles boiling there, that means that the liquid is slowly starting to thicken and it's boiling. So you want to let it do that very slowly, otherwise you'll burn the bottom. While that's happening, we're going to get our noodles ready inside here. Get them nice and warm. Now I pre-cooked my noodles here. You, I pre-cooked them at a level called El Dante. Basically what that means is that when you cook it, you can look inside the center of it, and inside the center, it'll have the tiniest little white dot in there. That means that the tiniest little amount of it is not fully cooked. So you can just finish cooking it in here like this. Ooh, that's hot. Always make sure you grab some cloth or something to make sure you're handling. Really hot. Ooh, boom. And uh, you want to let the noodles cook in with the sauce because the noodles is a starch and it will absorb all the flavor as well with everything else that's going in there. So if you notice it's getting a little too thick, you can add a little bit of cream just to thin it out a little so you have time to cook with it a bit more. It's always a good idea to test your sauce. You don't need much, you just need a little bit of test. Mm, it's perfect. All right. So next we're gonna plate it. Now when you're plating pasta, you always wanna give it a nice little twirl in this plate, like that. And that way it builds up a nice and high. Get all that nice, beautiful flavor that's left over in there. Like that. Chunk, or nice bison chunks. We're actually going to give it a nice little, little garnish of this gorgonzola. Just a little bit. Not much. And we'll finish the garnish off. A little cedar. Boom. And that is the little lost bison. I made that recipe. I wish I had a photo to show you. Um, and my whole family said it was amazing. So thank you, Mike, for that. Uh, we'll have his full recipe on our website, aptnnews.ca backslash in focus backslash indigenous cuisine. Uh, freezer full of pickerel, sick of having it the same old way. Well, you are in luck. Watch another recipe. So hi, my name is Steve. I'm cook here at Freeze Cafe Bistro. We're located at the corner of Sherbrooke and Alice. And we're on Treaty 1 territory. So the dish I'm gonna be preparing today, I'm gonna to call it Our Sister, and I'm gonna dedicate it to uh, missing and murdered women across our nation. So I'm gonna be working with, with corn. That's one of the three sisters. I'm also gonna be doing pickerel. That's, that's a white fish. It's also good for you. And I'm gonna be doing wild rice. So I'm gonna put it together here. Um, I start with, I do some very light, Easy, easy seasonings. Just salt and pepper. Fuzz, you want to grab me the uh, olive oil? Just 
salt and pepper. Drizzle of olive oil across it. Beautiful. We're gonna put that in our oven at 350 for 15 minutes. Okay, so what, so what we have here is uh, our cooked fish. Comes out nice and nice and beautiful. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna flog the pickerel. So I'm just gonna put it in a bowl. Nice like that. Use a fork. And just lightly break it up, break it apart. The two forks. So we're not gonna mush it, right? We don't want it to be mushed. We just want it to be nice and fluffy. So white fish is good for you, it's like good all around. You got it. should eat it once a week. It's good for your brain. It's good for your skin. Also kept our, our people alive for uh, a millennia. Especially here in Manitoba, we have access to pickerel. It's everybody's favorite. Okay, so next we're gonna get the uh, the filling for our fish cake and get that ready to go here. So we're gonna go with uh, the half a tablespoon of dill. Nice big tablespoon of mayo. This is um, garlic puree. If you don't have garlic puree, just use garlic clove. You chop it up, make it nice and small. Throw that in there. Some pepper. Some salt. Your egg mix that up so it's nice almost like a pudding texture almost so it's gonna be nice next we're gonna grab lemon if you don't have lemon you can use lemon juice it's fine. Okay. So we're gonna add our fish to our to our filling here. I like to get I like to get my pan nice and hot before I put what I'm working with. I'm using this this margarine, it's regular margarine. I like to use it because it's pure, it's clean, and it doesn't burn. And everybody has margarine in their house, so. So basically what we're going for is like, we're, we're using ingredients that usually, that, that you'd regularly have in your house. The fun part. What that size. A little bone there. Let's roll it around in the breadcrumbs a bit. If it falls apart, it's fine. Let's put some more breadcrumbs. Form it the best you can. cooking the rice you just put put a lot of water it's a little 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 overcooked a little dark but we got to get that cooked right through maybe I'll lower the heat a little bit more so yeah when I when I whenever I smell wild rice it always reminds me of uh, 
Reminds me of ceremonies, going to ceremonies when I was a kid. It's like that smell of, of family and people, uh, people are around, like, you know, when you're safe and, you know, you're learning, we're learning about a culture, we're learning about our traditional values and stuff, and that, that's what always brings me back to when, uh, when I smell the wild rice. So what I'm doing now is I'm still using margarine. Get that nice and hot. That should be pretty much. Okay. So what we're gonna do now is uh, get this nice and hot. I have a half of onion here. It's a half of onion. Nice and diced. Just gonna go ahead and throw it on. What we're going to do is get that nice and caramelized. A little bit more garlic puree, just to, it's going to be a little, if you don't have, if you don't have the garlic puree, you can go ahead and use like a, a whole garlic, mince it up. Get it nice and chopped up, nice and mincy. It's a little bit much. Yeah, I'm gonna put my corn. This is gonna be the fun part. So we're really gonna be cooking. So it's gonna start popping. As soon as it gets, as soon as it gets to the right temperature, it's gonna pop a bit. So I guess a long time ago, when they used to do the harvest around this this time of year, I could just picture this too. Like I guess they would take the uh, the corn kernels and put them on the rocks beside the fire, and then the. Uh, It'll pop, right? It'll pop like popcorn, and then they would be gathered out on fire, and I guess be catching, catching the popcorn in their mouth. I was picture that. I was imagining, especially when I'm working with corn. So again, this dish is called Our Sister. We're using the corn pickerel. All the stuff from the land. So we're gonna go ahead and let that cook. I'm gonna spray some water just to help the process of the cooking a little bit. And go ahead and cover it. Just drop some of that air in there. Mm. That's good. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and throw the uh, uh, wild rice in there. My well. That's the beautiful thing about wild rice. Mm -mm -mm. So now to plate it. Oops. And then I'm gonna garnish it. Oh, you can make tartar sauce, equal parts mayo, equal parts relish, and a pinch of dill. This goes just beautiful. And then we're gonna garnish it with some.
for all you Manitoba people out there. I know you guys all got big boxes of pickerel, so you, now you can have a new recipe for them. Thanks so much. That was a reminder too um, that that visit at Feast was shot before we were all in lockdown. Obviously, it wouldn't be possible now. Thank you so much for Feast uh, inviting us in. You can get those full recipes at our webpage, aptnnews.ca backslash infocus backslash indigenous cuisine. They are super easy to do. I've done both of those recipes. They are incredible. No fail. Uh, time for another break. Oh, I wanted to say too, to their shout out to our Facebook Live folks. We see you fiddlehead lovers out there and we recognize you. Uh, Maktak and Tuktu when we come back for you. Welcome back. Let's go to social media now with our social media editor, Jesty Andrushko, who is joining us from home today to hear what some of you guys are saying and see some amazing food pics. Thanks, Melissa. We went online looking for what First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people are harvesting. We wanted to know what your favorite food in the land was, and also we found some enticing dishes. A first from Roy, he posted some muktuk and tuktu soup with cornbread. Muktuk and tuktu are both inuktitut for whale and caribou. Looks good. Next from Pauline, she shared her oven cooked bannock and caribou. Delicious. Nice stuff, Pauline. Next we have Verna. She sent us a picture of her bullet soup and bannock. Bullet soup is a Red River Métis staple. It contained buffalo in the past, but now typically either has beef or pork. Looks very good. 
And lastly, from Harry, he shared his meal of young beluga muktuk and bowhead muktuk, along with dried pink salmon. Also, some dried ugruk meat, which means seal. Really, really good. Good stuff. Thank you to everyone who shared their awesome looking meals. If you want to share your meal or just sh share your thoughts with us, here's how. Join our conversation now. Call in toll free at 1-877-647-2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN In Focus and send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Thanks to you all for those food photos of your favorite foods, your country foods, your comfort foods. Chef Dicky Yuzichipi knows his food. He is the owner and chef at Sioux Chef Catering in Regina, Saskatchewan. He's the go-to guy if you have an event that needs indigenous food. Let's take a look at some of his creations. Dicky from Sioux Chef Catering, thank you for taking time out of your day to talk with us about food, something I think pretty much all of us love. Um, how's the catering business going through COVID? Uh, not that great. Uh, basically, my yeah. last catering event was in February, so uh, kind of been a long wait before doing some stuff for Christmas. Yeah, um, lots of cooking at home for your family. Oh yeah, yeah, doing all kinds of cooking. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. as soon as COVID hit, I went back to basics, making pasta from scratch and everything. So went right back to the start of all cooking. Yeah, uh, and I'm going to get to the Christmas, what you've got in store for Christmas too, because I know that's something that would be very of interest to our uh, audience. But I want to, we're talking here today about uh, our traditional foods, uh, the things that kind of just feed your soul. Sometimes it's a matter of uh, uh, old food, like old recipes. Sometimes it's just like our country foods with a new twist. When you think about something that nourishes your, your soul and our food, what's your kind of go-to uh, either meat or your dish, what 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 nourishes you? Uh, basically, it's uh, traditional foods to me is like the wild game, uh, elk, moose, mm. deer, buffalo, slow roasted over a long period of time. Basically, you roast it until it falls apart. You tear it up, put it mm. on top of a piece of bread or bannock or fry bread, put it all together and eat it. And it's, you know, that's, that's soul food. Um, yeah. Myself, I've always... Uh, Love mac and cheese. So it's always mac and cheese with five or six different kinds of cheeses in the cheese sauce. As you can see, I'm a big guy. I eat, so. <laughs> I was going to say five or six types of cheese in the cheese sauce. You have my attention. Uh, we'll have to, you know what you should do? Send us a recipe. Send us your recipe because we can post that uh, on our website to share that with others who are looking for some comfort too. Uh, I want to know, do you, out of the game, do you have a favorite is moose, caribou, deer, what's your favorite? And what's your favorite cut? And how do you like it done the best? Is there, is there a secret you could share with us? There is a little bit of a secret. Uh, everybody and anybody can actually cook game meats or a slow roasted. It'll fall apart. Basically, what you do is you get your choice of meat. You put it in a roast pan, mm -hmm. put about an inch of water in there, put it in your home oven and put it on the lowest setting at about uh, 11 o'clock in the evening and let it cook all night long at a low temperature. And by the time you wake up in the morning, that roast will fall apart. Do you have to cover it? So, uh, you can cover it if you want. Uh, I don't. Uh, the actual oven then does all the moisture itself within the oven, and then at the same time, it's it got browns the, water in the roast. It. Yeah, it has about an inch of water, inch and a half of water in there. You can spice it up any way you want, and like I said, 12, 13 hours later, that roast will fall apart. Got any tricks for duck for us? I know that's something that a lot of us kind of find comforting, especially at this time of year, right? We want our duck. Yeah. Uh, the easiest thing with duck is uh, you take your duck, you make sure you wash it nice and clean, all the skin. From there, you, uh, well, I render it before I actually bake it or roast it. So you put it in a frying pan on a medium heat and you let the fat kind of render it off. Then you put it in a pan, you put oh. all the ingestions on it. You pour the fat back in with the duck and throw it in the oven. And you know, four or five hours later, or two or three hours, depending on your temperature, your duck will be fully cooked. What temperature should it be? Uh, usually, if you want it done with about an hour and a half, you're about 350, 360. Okay. Okay, now let's get to last year we had on focus your cookie creations. What do you have in store for people to order online from you this Christmas? Uh, basically, it's the same cookies. Uh, I do them every year. Uh, I've been doing a, This is the 20th year now that I've been doing the cookies. Mm. 
And uh, originally when I first made them and baked them, they're about a five and a half inch uh, gingerbread cookie, a recipe that I came up with. It took about six months to get it right. And I know it by heart. I don't even write it down or leave the anywhere. It's uh, basically the same <laughs> recipe that goes in. And once the cookies are done, I decorate with chocolate, melted chocolate. And it takes half the time to do and the we're decorating. Looking at the, we're looking at the decoration, the, the cookies right now, which we had had on last year. I mean, they're just, they're beautiful pieces yeah. of work. And how yeah, do people I, order I, them? And you could deliver anywhere in Canada, right? Yeah, uh, order quick. Uh, go on Facebook, uh, punch up the sous chef for catering, and make sure it sees my picture on it because there is another company in the States that use the same name. But uh, I'm right. the only one that does the Aboriginal gingerbread cookies. And uh, order early. Uh, I start in December f uh, 1st to delivery. And uh, like I said, if you want them mailed out to you, get me as soon as you can for your order. Well, thank you for sharing that with our audience. And hopefully you get some uh, more gingerbread business drummed up here. And thanks for sharing your favorite food tips uh, with us. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you. We got to show you some of the pictures of uh, his food. Here is a breakfast hash that he makes, which just makes your mouth water. Uh, here's a duck dish. Incredible. And check out what he can do with squash. Ta-da! There's some berries in there too. We will post that mac and cheese recipe for you. Red cookies on Sous Chef Catering's Facebook page. Make sure that it's the right Sous Chef page. Uh, it's got a white and blue logo, not the orange one. That is an American Sous Chef, and I'm sure he and she does great work, but they don't sell gingerbread cookies. Okay, we're going to the phone now. We have Jody Pumlik, who is on the line with us from Arvid, Nunavut. Jody, you there? Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm good yourself. I'm great. We want, we're so thankful that you could take uh, the time to share with us some of the country foods that's loved in your community. Uh, I want to take a look. We've got a bunch of photos here of some of the dishes that you make. You provide these foods to so many uh, community members. Uh, so let's take a look at some of them now so our viewers at home can see some of your handiwork. Yeah. Yeah. So are you watching your TV? Can you see what we're seeing right now, Jody? Yes, I'm watching it right now. I can see myself and my name. What? Oh, just you. wait. <laughs> what are What are we looking at here? Um, I only see a uh, picture of the. Uh, oh, that's the caribou meat with all rice. Oh. It's a. Uh, uh, I call it duck to roast. So it's. Uh, I cook it inside my oven for like two to three hours and when it's finally ready, it's gonna be Love it. nice and tender as uh, supper. Okay, let's go to another picture. Yeah. Okay, it'll take us, it'll take a second here for you to see that because there's a little bit of a delay here, Jody. but um, I believe that we've got dried tuktu here and I'm not sure what is in the middle of it. We've got, a, it's a circle with the dried tuktu and then something that looks delicious on the on the inside of it are you seeing that now yes i can see that this is a uh, uh, dry meat tuk 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 we call it nipku n i p k u and the center part is the uh, uh, caribou marrow m a r r o w and we call it patek that we can eat it with anything country food oh. Okay, so you have graciously sent me Nipku and Kitko. Kitko, is that how you say it? Kitko? Nipku, N-I-P-K-U. And what was the other one? There, I think you'd sent me something else through the dried fat. Or is that... And that we're seeing that here on our phones or on our uh, TVs now. Uh, Jody has sent me this. Thank you so much. I can't wait to pick this up at the airport, Jody. Um, and we, we learned a little bit. Of, we learned some uh, Nuktitut as well. Yeah. Well, and I, I love what you do with the food. We've got some, you, you're just an incredible lady. We've got some pictures of you too, um, cutting up the caribou and drying it in your home. Uh, and it just warms my heart that you do all go through all of that work uh, and then share it with not just your loved ones, but your entire community. And that's really, that's yes, really what um, it's all about. There's lots of people. They love to buy my uh, dry meat, nipku or my baking cooking. 
So ever since that, um, I start I started sharing. Thank you for sharing this with us, Jody. We're all out of time. We got to go. Uh, but don't forget to check out aptnnews.ca backslash in focus backslash indigenous cuisine. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks to uh, Feast Bistro with Mike and Steve, to Kevin Gover at the National Museum of the American Indian, Dickie from Sous Chef Catering. Have a great afternoon. Thanks to all of you for watching.